right? So do we want to take a break? We, we have a coffee break scheduled for three. All right, well, what? So okay, a yeah, half hour. I can do a demo of, of Sidora as it is now. And then we'll go away, we'll come back, and then we'll get everybody to try it out. Does that sound like a good plan? Yeah. All right, so hold that thought for a moment while I go to my... That's not it. Oh, I'm not ready. <coughs> So I want to um, make the point here. So what you're going to see, we call this version 0 0.4 of Sidora. We had a prototype, and we improved the prototype, and we were working with two projects, the archaeology project I mentioned and email. And then we did a complete rewrite of that with what we learned from the first version, and now 0 0.4 is the rewritten pilot of that. And 0.4.1 corrected a lot of problems <laughs> that were obviously created in doing 0.4, and that was what was supposed to be available last week, but it isn't. So uh, there's going to be some niceties that will be fixed and nice additions, and audio files, audio resources will be in addition to that. Um, video is coming soon in the next release afterwards. And we're doing pretty quick releases. So um, anyway, oh, there it is. It's here. All right. So. Um, so as I said, this is a web interface. It's the data, when you put your data in, it goes behind the firewall, but you can be outside the firewall of the Smithsonian. So you can be anywhere you want. As long as you have a web interface, you can use this. Um, what happens is, so what you're gonna see here is, is the administrators, I'm an administrator of the system, so I can, uh, I can see everybody's data. So here's, all the test data and these RCM, these are the accounts we're going to use um, today. But so these are our different users. And so let's say I don't think any of our researchers are so far adding much data. But so this is this is the view from the Smithsonian Root Project. The entire repository is one big graph. And every time we give somebody an account, their object is a child of that. So the entire repository is one big navigable graph. And then when I give each person an account, they um, they get, as I said before, they get an object. Let's see, I know Richard doesn't mind if I show you who it is. Getting bigger and it's getting harder to find. There we are. Okay, Richard Cook projects. So Richard is my archaeologist in Panama. So okay. So this is the tree of concepts over here. So the the way the interface works is I highlight the concept I want to work on, and then under this concept overview pane, the metadata that's inside that that is the content of that object is formatted up. It's not very pretty yet, but this is the first version. So then that concept, if I have any resources, they would be under there. There's one resource. What was that? That was a test. No, this thing I'm going to get out. Ah, okay, never mind. Uh, I was going to show you the. Anyway, so let me go down to the. <coughs> I'm not, you have to bear with me, I'm really not used to using a PC anymore. So <laughs> having two buttons is, is really, <laughs> um, all right. Um, so this is eMAML. So the idea here, eMAML has, is we set this up differently because it was an early attempt. So the, the project as a whole, and I don't think he said much. So, okay, eMAML project, he hasn't said much. Um, and then the eMAML project is made up of a bunch of sub-projects. So the camera trap, Bill McShay's project is bringing camera trap data from all over the world together, and this home for it is at the Smithsonian. We now, the project I'm showing you, this is the production system, and we have 3.25 million images in this project already. Um, and we're still loading. Um, it wasn't supposed to be quite like that. 
Um, anyway, I won't get into that. But so the effects of consumptive and non-consumptive recreation on mid-Atlantic wildlife is Bill's project himself, his grant project. And so, all right, so what happens here is each of those, this project is studying parks and studying the human use of parks and how it affects the wildlife. That's the goal, that's what his project's about. And so he's he's has each project, each park is an object, and so I don't think he says a whole lot. So here's Shenandoah. Since we're right in the edge of Shenandoah, we'll look at that one. Yeah, this is a lot of this is given metadata, but he hadn't said much new about it. But so under that, so that's a that's a place object, a research site object. And then the Shenandoah, let's see, I don't think let's I'll just click on. All right, so this is a plot, a particular plot that he's studying within the park where he's setting up camera deployments. And it's 200 meters from the trail is what they call it. And then under that, there's a series, these are all deployments. And so each one of these is a concept object that is of type instrument deployment. That's a, one of the types we provide. And it's the record of what that camera saw for that time period in that place. And so if I click on 19C, we'll see if I can get the, the demo I like. All right, so this is all the content about that deployment. So it tells you when it was there, which camera was used. Um, yes, you know, that's one reason I like to use this. If you can read it, it says camera, camera deployment. No, camera handle broken off by a bear. A bear peed next to the camera for over a minute. <laughs> so I have, I actually, if I can find it, I'm going to try to show. I used to know where it was, but when they redid the system, the numbers changed. Um, I have a picture of the bear staring into the camera, so I like to pretend that it was the bear that broke the camera, broke the thing off. But anyway, so so in their in their architecture for for this project, each each deployment is the parent for the set of images that it took. So that the way they're working, most of them, Bill's projects anyway, they're two weeks in the field and then they move them. And so volunteers or researchers go out and pull the pull the the, uh, the, what is the um, card out of the camera, bring it back, put a new one in. We, they track which card and everything. But uh, and then it's it all the resources become children of it. So now I can uh, let's see, let's do a show fifteen. And then I can jump to this 187 pages, 19 pages of 50. And so I want to go to page eight. All right, let's see what I, there's some nighttime pictures. I was looking for that damn bear. <laughs> <laughs> I used to have, I used to have exactly the page I could get it. It was such a good guy. Oh, here, here, here. <laughs> shoulder. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. so, uh, oh, well, we'll go with the deer. All right, so if you highlight a resource, it brings up the metadata for the resource over in this field. Now I have a viewer. And there's that deer. Right now, this version, there's a pan and zoom, as a pan and zoom client is for images is one of the things that's in the next version that I wanted to have today, but didn't have it, but I can click on that. So um, the way this works, so the concepts, I have menus here that are rel relative to whichever object I'm focusing on. So if I like the highlighted concept is the one that's operative under this window that says concept overview. These are the things I can do with it. Um, I can delete it, I can add a new concept, and I'll show you in just a minute how we go about building out the concept structure. I can talk about, I can know about the relationships, come on. So this tells me which, this just has one parent. So this is that 200 meters in this research site object that's the parent of the deployment. Um, if I'm looking at the resource, and the highlighted resource, I can tell that this is the parent of it. In the prototype, something that they haven't gotten over here yet, it should be here, it lets you, we can drag and drop things to remove them around. I can hold down a key and drag it and it'll make a copy of the link. So that's how you, 
that's how you can start to have more than one uh, concept can be in more than one place, or I can just drag it around. I can drag the resources, grab it, and drag it into another place, which will make a new link to the same resource, or it'll move it depending on what you want to do. So that's there, but I, I, I can't demonstrate it right now. I'm sorry about that. Um, that's the basic interface as it is right now. Um, let me see. Wanna, okay, so let me go to, oh, I want to show you. That's showing you what they're doing. So let me go back. And Brent has graciously let me say that I will show you what he's been doing. And he can add to your discussion. All right, so Brent started playing with this. It's done a little bit. So he's got one object like, like eMAML, except we, we should have put eMAML under, um, under Bill McShay's object because he is the Smithsonian researcher who actually owns the project. We'll have to go back and get that, but we were changing our mind about how to do this early on. So anyway, so Brent, sorry, not Brent, not Brent. Yeah. <laughs> got it, Brent, sorry. So Brant's been doing this. So the Migratory Bird Center object, and this is his project with the Intel. Yeah, well, I mean, we could have multiple projects. This just happens to be one project. If you click on that project, there's at least some metadata associated yeah. with that. In this case, it's... Yeah. Oh, oh, no, I gotta be kind of a concept. Yeah. So, you know, this happens to be the specific NSF grant we have. So we have a project summary, we have an identifier, which is the grant number. You have some of the Kopi contact information. You can add a bunch of information about methodological approaches, where it's taking place, what the duration of it is. Um, and then each of the objects under that are all study locations that we're specifically working. If you click on, like, let's say just Puma 2.5800, that's one of the study locations at that location, which is a left. Um, it shows you where that location is. If you just um, make there's, there's objects underneath oh, that. Oh, yes. That. So then there's a bunch of individuals there, and that happens to be their identifiers, color band combinations. And then some of those individuals have resources that are associated with them. In this case, they would be data loggers we put in their territories that collected information about those individuals, who they interacted with, date of the interaction. Um, yes, you can just view that okay. file. So that's a, that's a tabular data object. Here's some metadata. Yeah, a lot of metadata, and then if you just go to the viewer, and there's obviously a code book that was associated with this, and I told that the variables were date, time, channel, tag ID, antenna, and power, and then that's the, that's the actual data. Yeah. So, I mean, the hope is that, you know, as this evolves, that we'll be able to feed it raw data files, and it will, using the R scripts that we've written, it'll process the data, and then push out um, actual yeah. Um, interaction files, who interacted with who, how frequently they've interacted, and that's based on the R scripts that we've written. But but again, it, it's it's a way to not only manage the data, but to process the yeah. data and do it in an automated way so that you don't have to sit there and just on each other on your own computer. And that's what we've done with Camera Trap runs much the same way. They're under all the, I just forgot to show you the, the tabular data. Under each one of those deployments, there are two tabular data files. The researchers look at the pictures and they register observations in a in a in a CSV file, basically with columns that they're capturing about the data, and they can do a query across across the entire graph of objects and bring back the observations they want, and then the workflow so they can they can do a, a query that brings back a set of of resources. That set, like I showed you in the picture, that set can then be pushed into into um, Galaxy and run through the, the workflow that they've already set up to do that. Same with yours. Yeah. You could do a query that says, a simple query could just be analyze all the birds under this lec. Yep. And then it brings back all the files and you could, I don't know what the data you have, all well, the time. So if, if you wanted to look at a particular time of day yep. and the query said time of day, it would bring back the whole file and then the, R, the, the, routine, the workflow at Galaxy would take the time as the first thing and extract only the records of that time and only use that file. And then they would go through the analysis, say generate a graph. That's what the, the camera trap people are using it to generate graphs and some other, they have some pretty simple R workflows um, that we built for them. Um, we were using Taverna at first, but it wasn't fast enough for the education people. Um, 
because all this, all the this kids have their cell phones and they want every school child in America to be able to do it as fast as they can, even though we're not ready. But that's another <laughs> thing. Um, anyway. Yeah, the one, one, thing, one thing that it has been a challenge is obviously you have to then type out all the metadata associated with everything, and it takes it takes time. And the, the one thing that I haven't figured out how to put up here is obviously for a lot of these studies we have capture history information of individuals over time, and that's so. Cap when you say capture history, what do you mean? So you know the date that an individual is marked, and then every subsequent occasion that that individual is encountered through time. But how, how do you? I mean, you could put it up there as a flat file, but but how it would be divided up across concepts might be a little bit challenging. I, mean, I think that there's a way to do it. Yeah. Um, just wrapping your head around it. I I didn't put any capture history data up here. No, so I'm not sure exactly. How no, I'd like to sit down with you and, and so this is what we're doing at this point. I'm getting a handful of researchers that are willing to be tolerant, and we sit down and start talking through it, and that guides how we're going to build the system as we go. That's how we're going to do it. Um, I think I said this at some point. I said it to people last night, maybe. But the idea, I may have said it earlier, that um, people like us are going to be in your life co-evolving with you. That's how we're going to start building the system now. I think it's how we're going to keep building the system forever. We're going to have projects that push the boundaries. We're going to build enough functionality, hopefully, to 75% of the projects can just do their work. But there's always going to be that other percent that pushes the boundaries, that brings in new resource types, that brings in new concept types, that brings in new workflows that need to be done, new tools that used to be used, need to be used. Our job is to push back and say, are you really unique? I mean, is this really new or is, it, um, is there a way to interpret it using existing? So there's a whole user services component and an analyst component that goes with this, right? And that's the, my department is, we're trying to Get the funds to build that whole. We're working with the library. Our library system is has a lot of people who work with the researchers already. We're experimenting with them to try to help them use the system so they can work with researchers. How do we build this whole sort of service? It's a research support service. I mean, you see, the whole idea is it's a real service of people, machines, software, all that is about. It's focused on supporting the research. This system is just one of the pieces. And, and there's lots more, but, but this system is really not, think of it not as a software system, but a software environment of lots of pieces of software that we're piecing together in ways that software is modern enough now that if we've gotten good at piecing software together in what looks like a system, that's where we'll, we'll continue forever, I think, doing that in more elaborate, powerful ways. But it's a framework that gives us a starting point is where we are right now. Um, all right, we have about... 12 minutes, so let me show you, I'll give you a quick demo of how to start working with the system, and then let me go to my own object so I don't screw up anything. This is the live data here. Um, so, all right. Oh, I don't like this. All right, so, okay, so I'm, Highlighted an object. I've highlighted my one of my accounts. I have several, um, and then this one it has. There's some, those are resources there, testing resources. Okay, so if I want to build out a new project under my object, I would go to concepts. I would say add a new concept, and this is right now the ontology of top level concepts that we support. So we have project, actor, place, built environment, object or entity, animal, plant, deployment collection, this says experiment, it really should be process, and then experiment is a subset of process. Event, we're gonna have idea, um, there's a couple more that we've already added that, that are in that version that was supposed to have. Um, but anyway, the way it works, so actor, if I wanna talk about a person or organization, or even an animal or plant, special animal or plant that was associated with this project, I could talk about a person or an organization. So we have top level concepts. Some have, if you roll over it and it's giving you the, the text, there is no sub project, sub concept. Um, but like built in, uh, let's see, place has general. So if I'm a humanities person, I'm talking about a place that has some association to an artist's life. I'd use general place, archeologic site. It gives you a different semantically meaningful input form that's specific to that type of um, site place. And then research site is 
like what you were seeing in the camera track. Um, so the idea is we'll build out, we will collect concepts at the top level, and as people want more specialized things, we'll add them. Um, the goal is to be able to, a longer term goal is to be able to let people build their own forms that sort of let them customize this. And so instead of using the default form, they would have their own form whenever, and they could have their own form under a particular project with a different, where that's on our roadmap to build. So you can customize and only see the fields that you want to put in there. But, but that's generally how you build that out. Um, and I'll show you one in just a minute. But let me go back here and go to resources. And resources is the same. I add resources, and these are the types that I support right now. Um, so tabular data sets, general image, digitized text. Um, let's see. I want to show you. Let me go back here. And I'm going to say concept, and I'm going to add a new concept. And I'm going to add a project object. All right, and so then I'm in the, the metadata form, and this is what's not so pretty yet. So I have to give it a, a title and let's say list, and I can type a bunch of text. And that can't be cut and paste at this time? Yeah, it, yeah, it can be cut and paste. If you open another window, you can cut and paste into it. Um, so I, it, we give, there's a metadata set, and the, the terminology can be customized based on the, the particular concept. But this is, right now, these are all the defaults. So you can have keywords associated with it. I can, uh, I, in all fields, in our metadata schema, here, let me go down to another more interesting one. Let's say time period. So I'm, I have a project, and I want to talk about the time period of this project, or a time period that's specifically associated with the project. These are all repeatable. All the, all the metadata fields are repeatable. Um, I can talk about the, so if it's, the creation time, when I started the start time of the project, I could put start time in here. Yeah, yeah typing is really the pain. Um, I could, and if I have a textual date where I just want to have a, like an era or an epoch or something mm -hmm. I want to talk, I'm a, I'm a paleontologist and I don't have real dates, I have big geologic eras, um, I could put that in there. If I have numeric dates, I have click on that, year, month, and day. The, these are the original version. This is part of a software package called Islandora that we built on top of Fedora. It's how we're building Sidora. Um, it, it can't let us put the fields on the same line. The new version lets us do that so you have a nice little date field that's quickly, you know, you can, it's a little nicer. Um, I can talk about, uh, I, I, and everything has notes. So I can have met actual metadata that's explicit metadata that's classification or typing metadata. And then I can have notes that are all associated with the time period of the type that I was talking about. So every field in here has both kinds of fields. You have a value. So I could have, if I go down here, um, let's say I close this one. I keep thinking you click on the arrows. I don't really. So context, well, why not? So uh, related people and organizations. So I can say, here's a person, here's a role, and it's uh, the funder of the project. And I, oops, I didn't want one to have a funder of the project. Well, let's say funder of the project, um, uh, a billionaire. Donald Trump. Right, Donald Trump. That's what I was looking for. <laughs> trying to think of a name, and it wouldn't come. All right, and I can, so I can add another funder. And I can say there's another funder because I got two different grants, and I can say Donald Trump. I misspelled his name, but I don't care. And if you, I mean, we have the email address. Yeah. That was it. <laughs> Something else. Um, so let me close that. Um, I want to close and see. So context is an interesting field. Remember, these are we're trying to come up with these fields that are general to everybody. And then you tune them by you by putting the type in there. So if I'm a biologist and say this was a form for a specimen, and I wanted to say something about the habitat that I found the specimen in, I could say context type equals habitat. And I could say marsh. Oops. 
but then I can also have context nodes. So I could, I could not have any classification metadata, and I could have concepts that were nothing but nodes, or were a mix of the two, or were just metadata. Ideally, we, we want to batch this in, so if you're gathering stuff, you batch it in, and then you can go in and add to it and add notes or whatever you want. Um, but that's the basic, the basic idea of that right now. Um, let me just kill this and so save it. And when you, when you want to, if I go to edit and I say um, edit metadata, I get that same form. That's how I go back and edit it. Um, so if I want to add a resource, and I want to, oh, I didn't have it. It was on my system. <laughs> I moved all my stuff over here. Well, anyway, I say add resource, and I want to add a tabular data set. First thing it does, it's finding my existing code book. Um, we, as I said this earlier, we require a code book. So the first thing, when you want to upload a tabular data file, if you already have a code book, you can just say which one you want and upload multiple files that all go with the code book. Um, but you, if, you wanna, if you don't have a code book, you click on the create and use new code book and you make the code book. And this isn't the prettiest interface right now, but basically you're giving it a title and you're talking about who made it and when they made the code book, and then you're just defining the, the basic variables. So you can say the different columns in the input form. Mm -hmm. I have a name for it. I can have a short, um, a longer name, a short name, like I know from doing a, a SAS and SPSS, having these labels already in the data. I can build a SAS file automatically from the code book plus a data file. I can do data range description. The format should be a pull down list, and it is in the new version. Um, now, what, what also the new version is going to have a way, it runs a program to populate the code book from the file you say is the model file, and it will put all this in, and then you can correct it. So we will do that. Ideally, the same kind of program, when you upload 20 files and you say they're all the same code book, we should be, after you do the upload and you go away, the back-end process will check them all. And if one of them doesn't match, it will send you a message and it'll mark it so you can't use it basically <laughs> until you fix it. Um, but that's the general idea for that's a special case of a resource that has this other, and the code book is another object that's part of your project. You can share, the idea is we want to share code books so you could have a data format that the community shared and you can have a code book that you can all get to and you all use the same one. The nice thing is that code book in that R, that R workflow that we're doing in Galaxy, that code book becomes a really powerful thing for saying, here's all this, I gathered these 10 files, they all share this pattern of variables, and I want to assign the variables to in the, the names of the data that are in the workflow. I can say, use this one for this, this code, this parameter of the workflow, and use that one for that one. So you'd have a, a first service that you run that configures the workflow, brings up your variables and lets you associate them graphically with uh, the variables that the, the workflow is looking for, and then you just run the workflow, right? So it becomes a very powerful thing. Um, I guess that's probably enough for now since it's way on time for our break. Um, we're gonna come back and I want, if, if you would, I'd love to have you play with it and give me some feedback. Um, and what we'll do is, I think when we come back, we'll pair off with people who I think maybe that do the same kind of work would probably be a good idea and you can sort of build out a little bit of a project and play with the different concepts and if you have an image file or a tabular data file or PDF you can upload them and see how it works and Paul and I will sort of walk around and help you. Um, all right. I guess Grant and Thorny provided a sample data set too that Thank Grant you. has sent around to everybody. If you just you know you don't have anything handy, yeah. then you can grab that data set and maybe you somebody could describe what it is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I yeah just a little tabular data file. And I figure people any kind of image just about that you have on your, your system should work. Yeah. So I want to follow on the question of processing the data. Let's say I have genomic data and. So what your the Sidora will do is that I would upload my data and then you push it to let's say a um, cluster or computer, analyze that, bring it back, and then document the well, comments I made and then there's two different now. 
we're, we're working on the, the we're going to add a resource type that is a, an assembled genome file. And when you upload a file, you say, this is an assembled genome file, and it'll upload it, and it'll probably just ask you for a title, and then it'll send it off to the back-end process. The back-end process, it'll get that file and run an analysis on it somewhere. Part of what we can, I mean, this, the distribution of the processing can be on any machine anywhere in the background, right? So yeah, it probably would go to Hydra, our cluster, run the program and bring back the metadata record and put it in the world. Okay. And so put it in that metadata file that you see there. So eventually the goal is to be able to process stuff when I'm inside or like. Well, that's just the not processing just it for upload. It's not doing doing a workflow. If you want to do a complicated statistic, some kind of, um, you're going to annotate that file. You're going to go take it into Galaxy and run it through something, and you'll bring back data that you create. Okay. But but there's a, a step in the upload where you're characterizing in some basic ways that genome file. That's what will happen right when you upload it. But that's all. It's just adding to the basic metadata for you. Um, Thank you.